Well, good morning and welcome to Christ Church. I'm David Hall, the vicar here, and it's my privilege to welcome you to church today. Um, and uh, really just a, a warm welcome to all our services. We have our 8.30 service, and that's a streamed only service. We've actually folded in our 10 o'clock and our 11.30 services into one service at 10.30 that also has our children's program in it. We've done that because I think it's, we feel it's better logistically. We're able to keep everyone safe. Um, and also because we're now on the, you know, firmly into January, we are also meeting tonight at 6.30 as well. That's a live service. You can book for that as well. And you can also enjoy that online. Uh, so whatever shape or form you join us in, we really pray that as we begin this new year, you will feel encouraged to set your eyes uh, on heaven, to look to Christ and to receive the power of the Holy Spirit to help you live for him right through this coming year. So I really hope that you'll be spiritually blessed in these times that we spend together. God bless. <laughs> A very warm welcome to our 8.30 communion service. I'm Terence Russoff. And we begin with our opening prayer of preparation. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may truly love you and worthily praise your holy name. 
through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy on us and incline our hearts to keep your laws. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we now have our prayers of intercession followed by our Bible reading. And now we come to our intercessions. Let us pray. Loving God, we pray for our world in all its turmoil, particularly the nations of the world as they battle with coronavirus. And we ask that you will have mercy on this world that you have made. We ask that you will be particularly gracious to those nations that are short of resources and struggling to deal with the medical and social and economic implications of this pandemic. We also ask that you will have mercy on the United States of America and you will enable Christian voices to come together with authority and bring that nation to a place of healing and restoration that it might model democracy and Christian values to the larger world with credibility, with authority and with compassion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for our own nation as it battles with the problems of the pandemic and also the implications of Brexit. Loving God, grant wisdom to all those who are in authority. We pray for Her Majesty the Queen, for her ministers, all those in government, those in opposition, those contributing to the public debate, and those with scientific authority advising us as we seek a way forward on the issues that confront us. Loving God, please grant an end to this pandemic. May there be speedy vaccination. May there be safety for your people. And may there be great wisdom as we find a way forward to recover economically and as we place our um, economic arrangements on a new footing and seek to renew our relationship with other countries in Europe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for our church family as we try to find a way forward as we meet both in person and online, and as we seek to engage with your direction for 
our lives and as we seek to make wise decisions about the resources that you have given us and the challenges and opportunities and the changes that this pandemic has brought to us as a worshipping community of people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lastly, Lord, we bring to you ourselves and those that we are concerned about. And in a moment's silence, we bring the needs of those for whom we have a special concern and we name them before you now. Loving God, comfort those who are sorrowing, heal those who are sick, restore those who have suffered loss. Be with us all, we pray, and help us to glorify you. Help us to rejoice in your goodness. And we call to mind these words of Psalm 59. I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. For you have been to me a fortress and a refuge in the day of my distress. And so we bring our prayers together and to a close in the words of the Lord's Prayer in its traditional form. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. We come now to our Bible reading, which is taken from Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 25. Matthew 6, verse 25, and I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Matthew 6, verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you O oh, you of little faith, therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Right, well, we're going to look at that passage from Matthew 6, verse 25 to 34. And uh, we're looking at these verses under the title... God's command not to worry in a pandemic. God's command not to worry in a pandemic. Let's pray. Oh, loving God, we thank you uh, that when your son Jesus Christ was here on earth, he taught with such care, such authority, and such inspiration. And Lord, we thank you that his words have been accurately recorded. And today your Holy Spirit can lift them off the page, place them in our hearts, inspire our lives, change situations in real time now. 
uh, with incredible sweeping power. And we praise you for that. And we ask that will be our real lived experience, that these words just won't be words of interest or challenge maybe, or even mild encouragement, but they will be life-changing words. And your power will change us for the good and help us to respond to your call in this whole area of worry. This we ask for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as I said, we're going to um, look at the subject of God's command not to worry in a pandemic. I, I was reading on Friday about the life of Howard uh, Rubinstein, who was one of the leading public relations gurus in New York. Uh, his business dealings covered everyone from uh, Mike Tyson to the Pope. That's quite a contrast, isn't it? Um, at a party in New York to celebrate 50, his 50 years in public relations consultancy, the governor of New York joked that if Rubenstein had been representing rats at the time of the Black Death, the newspaper headlines would have carried this headline, rodents unfairly accused of mild rash. Rodents unfairly accused of mild rash. Well, there's no gloss that we can put on the current pandemic. Here in the UK, we're facing lockdown three. And it seems that everything that we have done, everything we have done to beat the pandemic has failed. And our only hope is the progressive vaccination of the entire population that tries in some way to stay ahead of any mutation. And in this environment that we are living in, both here and uh, all across the world, every worry that we have had, every worry that we had, it seems, before the pandemic has just got worse. If we were worried about a relationship, uh, it's under more strain. If we were worried about our finances, they have been further damaged. If we were worried about our job, it has become less secure, or we might even have lost it. If we were worried about our health, it's quite probable vital treatment has been delayed in some way. But you know what? Before the pandemic, we worried about things, didn't we? To worry is to be human. Um, worry is a problem that doesn't need the pandemic for it to be there. But worry is a problem that does need God. And this teaching of Jesus is the greatest teaching uh, that has ever been seen on the subject of worry. I was learning about the early days of the Flying Doctor Service uh, in Australia um, yesterday. And um, it was an amazing way it kind of sprung up. Uh, at the, the inception of the Flying Doctor Service, uh, I think it was two flying doctors uh, covered an area of uh, uh, the size of England and Wales. Um, and they would frequently deliver their diagnosis via radio, sometimes to incredibly remote places. And quite often, um, their radios would be powered by the dynamo of a bicycle with someone pedaling furiously. The doctor wasn't running along behind, uh, it was all up on a stand, but that was the source of power. And every remote home had this cabinet with numbered drawers in it and each with a different medicine, and a doctor treating a patient would tell them which number to use. I think it's amazing that you could be massively remote, miles, hundreds of miles away from perhaps a doctor or anyone else, and you could have on-the-spot diagnosis and cure just in your, in your home, in that one location. And this passage basically contains a diagnosis and a cure in one spot. Whenever I'm trying to um, help someone either re to recover a situation, either it's a resourcing issue or a staffing matter or a pastoral issue or whatever it is in ministry, I often have to ask myself, what is the full horror of the reality of this situation? And often it doesn't come out straight away, but only with an honest diagnosis can we move towards a cure. And sometimes we have to live with the problem a little bit before we see God's healing and his restoration and his hope. And we're going to do that now. You see, in verses 25 to 27, we have a diagnosis. And I think in a way it can be quite painful. We're gonna to have to look at the full horror of what we're dealing with and all the things that we get wrong about worry. And then in verse 28, Jesus takes us gently towards a cure. Only God can give a cure and he takes us to that cure. I must say, as a clergyman, I feel uniquely unqualified to talk about worry. I'm a worrier by nature, 
and uh, and in the course of our work you know we clergy we kind of deal with the tragedy end of life quite a lot and that means every time that I get a bump or a pimple or a scratch I tend to panic and say we're doomed uh, so I'm a I'm a reluctant member. If you're a worrier, I'm a reluctant member of your worry club. Uh, I'm a worrier talking to other worriers about worry. Now, diagnosis. Let's look at all the things we get wrong about worry. Well, first of all, we worry about the wrong things. In verse 25, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Now, we might, of course, think that uh, we don't worry about these trivialities, uh, but yes, we do. Um, just before Christmas, I was in Tesco, and um, the man in front of me was very aggressive uh, with a shop assistant. And I said to the shop assistant, I said, oh, gosh, that was a bit fierce. Do you get that treatment often? And he said to me, yes, we do. He said, and Christmas is the worst time because people are so stressed. And this Christmas is going to be the worst Christmas ever because people will be more stressed than ever. And yet, when you think about it, we, we never go into a supermarket for anything more dramatic than a few groceries. But sometimes people treat the people who are trying to serve them as if they're trying to stab them. Actually, these verses merely illustrate how we worry about the wrong things. Outside a time of a pandemic, most people, it seems, worry more about they will, where they will spend their two-week summer holiday than where they will spend eternity. And if we're doing that, we are worrying about the wrong thing. The second thing we get, about, we get wrong about worry is that we worry about how we will provide rather than how God will provide. Verse 26, look at the birds of the air, says Jesus. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Now, the, the appeal here is on the basis that we are valued by God. And when we read this phrase, gather into barns, well, actually, it sparked a thought in me. I think it's there for a reason. Jesus is reminding us of a parable he tells in Luke 12, which in some ways is the most frightening parable that Jesus ever tells anyone. Because in the eyes of society, this man is a respectable businessman who gets everything right. Luke 12, verse 16. And Jesus told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself, and is not rich towards God. So this man in Luke 12 actually gets everything wrong spiritually. He lives a life of respectful or rather um, prosperous indifference to God. He mistakes his body for his soul. He mistakes himself for God and he mistakes time for eternity. He's just like us in so many ways. How could we get it so wrong? So when Jesus mentions with approval the birds of the air not storing things in barns, he's reminding us of how easy it is for us to be like that rich man and worry about how we will provide for ourselves rather than God, how God will provide for us. The third and the last of the ways in which we get worry wrong in relation, get things wrong in relation to worry is that we worry as if the more we will worry, the better things we'll get. Verse 27, and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Mary and I uh, bought a sofa uh, some years back, and when we bought it, we were persuaded to pay a few pounds more for special insurance on the cover of the sofa. And um, it basically said if the cover was stained in the next three years, it would be replaced. Somewhat inevitably, with four kids, the cover got stained. And we rang the number on the insurance certificate several times and it slowly became clear 
that that company had prepared very carefully for that day when we would call. They asked very specific questions concerning the stain on the cover, what substance it was. Some things like curry were not covered. How had it landed on the cover? Had we been careless? How long had we left it on the cover before calling them? And after several fruitless conversations, during which a small tube of stain remover arrived in the post, we realized that we were on our own, never to buy insurance at the point of sale again. When it comes to worry, are we on our own? Because if we are, the fact that we worry about the wrong things, that we worry about how we will provide that rather than how God will provide, and we worry as if the more we worried about things, the better they would get, that means that worry represents a burden too big for us to carry, but only if we are on our own. Okay, we've done the diagnosis. What about the cure? Let's look at all the things that God gets right about worry. Well, interesting enough, sometime after I, we bought that sofa, <laughs> I also bought a camera, and I was offered additional insurance at the point of sale. Now, it was interesting when they sold it, because I looked very carefully at the pitch. They didn't say, you know, if you try to claim, we'll ask you lots of awkward questions, we'll perhaps take it for repair, and if the store's a long way away, we'll make you pay for delivery and so forth. They said this, for a one-off payment of £20, you can have peace of mind for three years. That is an amazing camera purchase, isn't it? As well as autofocus and red dye reduction, you get peace of mind for three years. If a camera purchase would bring peace of mind for three years, why are we using our mobile phones to take pictures? But that's actually what we need, isn't it? To function as human beings and as Christians, we need peace of mind. What does God get right about worry? Well, first of all, God's provision for us far outmatches our provision for ourselves. Verse 28, and why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? When I look at these words closely, I see two things. First of all, in verse 30, uh, the grass doesn't just wither and die. It's thrown into the oven. It's a conscious action. It's a disturbing image, evocative, possibly of God's judgment. You decide whether that's a reasonable thing to say. I also see an image of the most extraordinary beauty and glory. We're reminded of the glory of Solomon, when the kingdom of Israel was at the absolute height of its wealth and its prestige, what could be greater than the clothing of Solomon, the clothing of God? Now, why does he use lilies here as a symbol of God's provision? Well, since ancient times, lilies have been associated with death, the white color representing purity and the powerful aroma overcoming the scent of death. There is only one person who is truly pure, and there's only one sacrifice that overcomes death. That is Jesus Christ. The spiritual clothing which God provides through the completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross is clothing that makes us pure in God's sight, overcoming the smell of death. So in Isaiah 61, uh, when the prophet Isaiah foretells the work of Christ, he uses the image of clothing. Isaiah 61 verse 10, I will rejoice, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, for as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before the nations. So God provides, and God's provision for us outmatches by far our provision for ourselves. The second thing that God gets right about worry is that he commands. 
He commands us to worry only about pleasing him and nothing else. Verse 31, therefore do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. On a wet and cold Friday evening in November 1986, a 30-year-old major in the Royal Engineers called Robbie Hall, no relation to me, um, took uh, a call, a phone call. It informed him that there was an unexploded exploded Second World War, World War bomb which had been found in a working gas holder in Beckton in East London. There were millions of gallons of water in this gasometer and they could not be pumped out without severely poisoning the Thames. So he and a team were winched down 100 feet in their dinghy onto the surface of this water that had been stagnant for 50 years. He then dived off the dinghy down through this scum to the unexploded bomb below. But the sludge that he was driving through, he was diving through, blocked his breathing apparatus and he took a lungful of it. He said this, close to panic, 10 meters below, and conscious that my colleagues at the surface were blissfully unaware of my crisis, I found myself praying, handing the whole situation to a God I had never previously acknowledged. Amazingly, he managed to clear his lungs and his breathing equipment and safely remove the bomb and then come to Christ. People expected him to leave the armed forces and become a vicar, which of course, as you know, also involves defusing bombs. Um, but he stayed for the rest of his career as an active Christian in the army, serving in bomb disposal. And he said this, I knew I was where God wanted me to be. Where does God want you to be? And what does God want you to do? Put that first. Verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. In other words, put God first and everything else will fall into place around it. Does that mean no problems? No. Robbie Hall, um, this major, uh, died of spinal cancer in November, aged 63. But he knew he was where God wanted him to be. And that is all that matters. So God commands. He commands us to worry only about pleasing him and nothing else. The final thing God gets right about worry is that God comforts. He will take care of tomorrow. Verse 34, therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. So as I conclude, um, we get a lot wrong about worry. We worry about the wrong things. We worry about how we will provide for ourselves rather than how God will provide for us. We think the more we worry about things, the better they'll get. But God already knows. The great physician sees this pandemic of worry. He sees it spreading. He sees it taking over our lives. And he has a cure. He provides. And his provision for us far outmatches our provision for ourselves. He commands, he commands us to worry about pleasing him and nothing else. And he comforts, he will take care of tomorrow. If in spiritual terms, we are facing our own personal pandemic of worry, then I am so glad that in Christ, God has given to all of us the vaccine. Let us pray. I'm going to take a little moment of quiet now, just perhaps to bring to God something that is of a particular worry or concern to us, and then I'm going to pray. Let us bow our heads for a moment of prayerful reflection. Loving God, we come to you as our great physician recognizing you have both the diagnosis and the cure for our worry. Forgive us, Lord, when we worry about the wrong things. 
when we worry about how we will provide how the, how, rather than you will provide. When we worry as if the more we worried, the better things would get. Loving God, thank you that you get worry right, that you provide and your provision far outmatches our greatest possible provision for ourselves. Thank you that you command us to focus and worry only about one thing, living for you and for your kingdom and nothing else. And thank you that when we do that, you comfort us. We can leave tomorrow in your hands and we can step forward with confidence and face the challenges of today. So help us, loving God, to give thanks for your provision for today, to follow you tomorrow, and to trust you for eternity. This we ask for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue by affirming our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, universal and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Let us share with one another a sign of the peace. Well, we now come to a time of Holy Communion, beginning with our Eucharistic prayer. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right. It is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise. Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, therefore with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, who in your tender mercy gave your only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. 
he instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray and grant that we, receiving these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Draw near with faith. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies, we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table. But you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Christ's body, broken for you. Christ's blood, shed for you. And we now say our prayer after communion. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us. So we and all your children shall be free. And the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Or before our final hymn, during which our collection is taken for the mission of this church to our parish and to the world, a final blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. 
and the blessing of God, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and those you love now and evermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.